Good morning, Brave Schoolers. Today is Thursday, and we are reading from my book, A Gracious Face. Yeah, that tea cozy, that is one of our tea cozies. Uh, Brave Writer sells poetry tea time tea cozies. Now that one was really popular and sold out, but we still have two other gorgeous uh, tea cozy designs. And you know what? Maybe tomorrow I'll show those to you in case you want to get one before the fall gets too far underway. They're fabulous for poetry tea time and sort of jazzing up your table. All right, so just to recap real quickly. Every day I read an essay from my book, A Gracious Space for Fall. The reason that I titled this series, A Gracious Space, is that it's my wish and hope that you are creating a gracious space in your homes that this isn't just about academics, it's not just about getting kids to do what they're supposed to do, it's not even about building a lot of character. <laughs> character is formed in reaction. And one of the things that helps kids feel strong and secure is knowing that the place where they call home is a safe place for them to grow up, to feel loved, to feel nourished. And none of us get it right every day. And some of us even have systemic issues that we're coping with right now, trying to bring in a gracious atmosphere in the midst of real trauma, pain, dysfunction. I want to give you a word of encouragement this morning. Anytime you, expend, you extend grace to someone in your family, you are contributing to the tributary of graciousness. And you can't live by that thought as a rule or you'll ruin it. Graciousness is not something you impose or pretend or make happen. It's not a strict set of principles. It is the moment where you suddenly gain awareness and can just be with the other person or be with whatever that trauma is or be with the hilarity and emotion that befalls the space. It's, it comes not because you force it, it comes when you create space for it. And so each day, I hope that these readings give you a point of reference that gives you a little more space for the truly quirky, wonderful, hilarious, sometimes painful environment that your home is, like all of our homes. There is no perfectly straight path to the life you want. All we can deal with is the life we have. And if you can have a little grace toward that, toward yourself, and create some for your kids and your spouse, you have a good day. All right, well, so today is day 18, and we are reading a chapter called Happiness Is. I read a blog the other day that reminded me, happiness is not a completed puzzle with all the pieces glued into place, varnished, framed, and then hung on the wall as though once you find that last piece and arrange it in the missing space, completing the puzzle just so, you will have achieved happiness and that quest will be finished. It makes a great picture, but can happiness really be contained in a still, framed, lifeless image? It's so easy to think that if I pad my cell with the right set of philosophical bumpers, I will avoid sharp objects and intrusive voices that wreck my peace. I thought about it more. Happiness at home, as I've observed it, is the experience of being okay with my homeschool the way it is today. Unfinished, messy, incomplete, spilling out the sides, running down the legs of the table, and busting through the neatly graphed lines of my schedule. So that's the problem with joy in the journey thinking. We still try to get somewhere so that we'll finally feel justified in feeling happy. What if happiness is utterly different than we've been led to believe by advertisers, gurus, and advice givers? Happiness in my homeschool looks like slathering a big, thick layer of yummy love across my imperfect self and my silly, sometimes struggling, sometimes thriving bunch of little rascals that live their own version of happy in the middle of the mess. It's forgiving myself for my lack and inadequacy and recognizing that I don't have all that it takes to homeschool. Some days I don't even have half of what it takes. 
Happiness comes when I'm least expecting it, when a moment stirs me or catches me off guard, like a hug and kiss, or a brand new word read, or a note pinned to my pillow, or a pair of kids playing with art out arguing for 10 whole minutes. It comes when I give up, give in, and let today be what it is. It comes when I trust that tomorrow will be okay too, and I can look back at yesterday and think, that wasn't all bad. Looks even better in hindsight. Happiness is a state of being, not a goal achieved or a mindset created or a philosophy rigidly followed. It comes when you let go and float and let the waves of your life ride. Think of labor, yielding, trusting, crests and valleys, but oh so good and leading to the oh so right and messy too. If you're in that space of self-recrimination where you can't figure it out, can't identify what's going wrong, if you wish you were better at being a mom or teaching math or having big juicy conversations, stop. Go inside. Let yourself fall apart a little bit. Be good to you. Accept who you are. Wrap that hurting self in a pair of big strong arms. You're okay. I know you want to grow and change and be better. We all do. One way to get there is to stop trying to fix it. Simply be where you are, as you are, living with the magical people entrusted to your care. You don't have to solve it. You can keep going. You can embrace the uniqueness that is your life, trusting that over time, everyone will find their way when you stop pushing so hard to make it all fit into that framed puzzle. Happiness may find you yet. Quote of the day. I really love this, Julie. Fits so many aspects of our real messy lives, especially for women, with our tendency to judge ourselves so harshly, especially right now for me in reference to our bodies. Love them now as they are, in process, fluid, Thank you. That was from Debbie Nielsen. Sustaining thought. Make a mess. Loving and being. So that's kind of a big one this morning. And I have to read it to me. Last week, I went right in for the whole mess. The whole mess. I sobbed because I can't get my house in order. I thought by the time I was 55, I would have magically solved the chaos that is the natural state of being of the rooms in my house. Now, I know how to whip it into shape, like I can still get it organized enough to have somebody come over, but I know what's inside the closets. I know all the pictures I've never sorted through or put in albums. I know all of the pieces of everyone's stuff that I haven't managed to put in the right containers or get out of the house, the empty paint cans, the dolls, all of the toys, the things that I thought by now I would have handled. And it made me fall apart. I felt like I was failing at adulthood. Do you ever feel that way? You're like, I'm failing at adulthood. Where are the adults? <laughs> I know they keep looking at me, but it can't be me because um, look at my life. <laughs> this cannot be what it looks like when you get to adulthood. Uh, my sister, who I love, Erin, she made the best comment one time and I've never forgotten it. She said, I have the wrong personality for my temperament. Do you know what I'm saying? She's like, I like clean lines, empty spaces, organization, but my personality doesn't know how to do any of it. So she lives trapped between her personality and her temperament. At least this is what she tells me. But I get that. I get that because even though I have some peace with mess, I had five children and I have a sense of, you know, vibrancy in the way I live, which creates a kind of clutter. I loved growing up in a house where my mom and dad were absolutely orderly. Every room you walked in was just a pleasure to be in <laughs> because it was both welcoming and neat. And sometimes I worry about me not being good enough at that, at this stage. So let's think about you. Are you going through a little of that right now? 
Debbie, in the quote of the day, brought up her own body. I remember Nora Ephron writing so beautifully in one of her books. I think it was the I Still Feel Bad About My Neck book, but it might have been in her other one. Um, but here's what she said. She realized with horror that she went off to college and came home the next summer and had gained weight and had gone from being like 100 pounds to 126 pounds and had to get all new clothes and body shamed herself for years only to discover that in her 60s, that's about what she weighed and all the battling of her whole life to try and figure out her body. And she was a short little gal, um, was for naught because that was basically just what she was always going to weigh. And I think some of what we're going through as women is this perfectionist tendency, this idealized self. We see it happening all around us all the time. It's not just trying to keep all the balls in the air. It's trying to keep them in the air really high. <laughs> like give yourself credit. If you have five kids that you did some homeschool with today and you made dinner, that's amazing. It might be difficult to also make money that day or mow the lawn or take care of the dog. Like it's amazing. You kind of have to rotate through the things that are on your list and you can't necessarily get them all done in one day. I had to be reminded by my own team to take my own advice, to find some self-love around for me. And I always have hated that language of self-love. Like to me, it just felt phony, felt very daytime TV. <laughs> you know, it felt like Cosmo, American Girl. Love yourself, love yourself, Disney Channel, right? So one of the ways that I work around my disregard for the language that everybody advises because it stops being meaningful for me is I find my own language. I look for something that helps me. And for me, it isn't self-love, even though that's a wonderful word pair and I urge you to use it if it works for you. But what works for me is self-care. And that is a little different because what I do is I pop out of myself and I pause and I think, what could I do for her right now? She's hurting, how can I help her? How can I help her? And for some reason, that shift in language helps me. And self-care is different than self-love. Self-love almost makes me feel like I have to be self-admiring. And sometimes that's hard for women. It's hard for me to look and go, oh, Julie, you're so awesome. <laughs> that's kind of what it feels like when I see self-love. But self-care is like, ah, oh, maybe I'll go sit in the sunshine and just stare at my backyard and not work for 10 minutes. Or... Gosh, it would feel good to snuggle up in a cozy sweater and watch a rerun for a half hour. Or maybe I just need a long run. Maybe I just need to get out of this house. Do you notice this pattern? <laughs> Getting away from the computer helps me. Um, so self-care. In the Homeschool Alliance, my little coaching community, literally we post a self-care practice every day uh, or every week of the month. And there are things like deep breathing, standing outside and stretching up your arms to the sky and bending over and looking at your feet and remembering that you are rooted in the world and that you are held in place by the gorgeous sky and the ground underneath your feet and knowing that you are just a blade of grass in the grass, grand scheme of living. You're not special, but you are special, but you're not special. The whole scheme of the universe it's not hanging the balance, waiting for you to get it right. You're getting it right enough for the whole thing to keep going, for the operation to keep going. This isn't about figuring out how to make the most unique, the most perfect contribution. It isn't about how to make sure your kids grow up to be superstars. It's simply abiding in your place and acknowledging that it's good, that it's here for you that you're here for it. And then you'll deal with what comes. And what's coming, some of it isn't good. And some of it is so amazing, it will take your breath away. And somewhere in that mix, every now and then, you get what we call a surprise of happy around here. A little surprise, it darts in under the radar, you weren't planning for it, you didn't know it was coming, boom, happy. Hits you, right in the solar plexus. <laughs> You can even put a little hashtag, surprise a happy, 
and you can share that anywhere I am, and I will come and give you a personal high five. The surprise of happy came from when I was going through my divorce. One of my best friends happened to be going through one at the same time. People going through divorces find each other, and they become best friends. <laughs> and this just happened to be someone I was already very close to. And on one of my darkest days, I was calling her, and I, I told her that I could not feel happiness. In fact, I was really active on Twitter back then, and I remember reading all of these quotes about how to be happy. You know, every day someone's giving an affirmation or a little quote of positivity. I would read those quotes and think, I can't remember what that feels like. I literally, I was like, I don't know what happy feels like. I've lost it. It's like not in my emotional range. And I felt like I was underwater looking up at the sky asking, how will I ever get that feeling back? Will it ever come? How do I get out of the water and into the sky? Like that's literally how it felt to me. And so I called my friend and I was telling Sherry this whole experience through tears. And she, who has eight kids, going through her own divorce, said to me, Julie, we can't make happy happen. She goes, I just gave up. I decided, universe, it's back on you. <laughs> if I'm going to feel happiness, it's going to have to surprise me. So I just wait every day for a surprise of happy. I wake up in the morning and say, I know I'm not happy. I need to be surprised by something. I can't make it happen. And simply by being on the lookout, she started having them occur. And that was a shift for me. I, I just, <sighs> I just gave up, just gave up. Let my shoulders sag, let my stomach hang out. <laughs> I gave up trying to keep my shoulders back, to put the smile on my face, to tuck in my tummy. I just gave up. And then I just stayed alert. And sometimes the surprise of happy was so mundane. It would be, that was funny on that television show. And it made me laugh for a moment. Sometimes it would literally be an angle of light coming through the window while I was at the sink. And suddenly the bubbles lit up for a split second. But because now it wasn't my responsibility to make myself happy. And now because I wasn't looking for my happiness to tell me something about the grand scheme of my entire life, I started feeling surprised by happy. I didn't quite feel happy, like if you know what I mean, all the way through every day. But what happened is little glimpses of what it was like on the other side of the numbness and the pain and the insecurity and the loss. I could see into a little bit of hope that the world had not gone completely dark and that happiness was coming for me. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. I hope you can search for a surprise of happy too. I'm going to post a link to my favorite poem by Jane Kenyon and it is called Happiness. I don't want to read it because it's copyrighted, but I will post a link to it and I advise you to read that poem today because she says what I said in far more eloquent language. And I think it will mean a lot to you. She wrote this while she was going through cancer. So that gives you an idea of where her context for grappling with happiness comes from. And I read that poem over and over during the dark period I was in. So if you're going through hardship today, if this time in your life is not your happy time, happiness is coming for you. Stay alert. Let it surprise you. And if you are in a season of real joy, you have overcome something, you've repaired something, you've watched your children blossom, someone who didn't read is now reading, if you are experiencing the joy of a well-lived life, a gracious space, everything aligned, please notice. Do not drum up something to criticize in order to feel like you matter or to feel like there's something to work on. 
while things are working. Do not take the homeschool hand grenade and throw it into the living room. Promise me you will fully inhabit today's peace. Okay? Our job isn't to manufacture hope. Our job isn't to manufacture problems. Our job is to live in the now with these spectacular children we are privileged to parent and to create a space where happiness can show up. I'm Julie Bogart. Live honestly, write bravely, and be on the lookout for a surprise of happy. I love you guys. Have a great day.